President Biden pulled U.S. troops out of Afghanistan recently, and that opens the door for domestic and international security threats. Find out what that could mean for all of us. My conversation today with former National Security Advisor Fran Townsend starts right now. She's an anti-terrorism expert who served as Homeland Security Advisor under President George Bush. I'm happy to welcome Fran Townsend to discuss some of the threats we're facing both here and abroad. Fran, what's your view on the way the U.S. left Afghanistan? Nancy, thank, first, thank you for having me. I can't think of a better person to have this conversation with. Um, look, I couldn't imagine making this decision, frankly, to withdraw troops entirely. 2,500 people, you know, President Biden said that he wanted to take the 2,500 out because we had other priorities, China, uh, cyber, you know, other sorts of priorities. Taking 2,500 troops out was not going to make a difference to those priorities. You know, this is a, a United States military, the greatest military in the world, uh, can walk and chew gum. We could have done both. And by the way, leaving the 2,500 in there support, would have supported Afghan troops, would have allowed our allies to stay, mm -hmm. and would have also, frankly, allowed the contractors who support the Afghan forces to stay. And so for a whole bunch of reasons, it was a horrible decision. And even if you were going to make the horrible decision, you could have executed it better. There could have been more warning for the U.S. military so that they could have planned better. You could have gotten those right. Afghans who supported mm -hmm. U.S. forces out. In a, in a more organized way. And so all around, it was a poor decision, poorly executed. And, and, and let's talk about those optics of that withdrawal. What message have we sent now to both our allies and enemies? So, you know, we, we've abandoned, frankly, the battlefield entirely to forces like China, Pakistan, Iran. Um, who are responsible, frankly, for the, the rise and the support of the Taliban. Um, and so it's a message of weakness. What you hope is somebody like China doesn't misread it when they look at a situation like Taiwan, that we're unwilling to back up our commitments with U.S. forces. Um, so our enemies take a very dangerous message from, from this. And our allies, mm -hmm. once again, we're telling our allies, you can't depend on us. We, we don't have this sort of fortitude to continue even when it's tough. And frankly, we have not suffered a U.S. casualty in, you know, a very long time prior to the withdrawal. And so I, I'm not sure why President Biden felt the need to do this at all. And on top of it, the Taliban are claiming that they've changed their approach, that they're now kinder and gentler. What's your reaction to that? You know, Nancy, we, during the Bush administration, had the first lady had made such an investment in the, in the university, uh, the American university in Afghanistan, and women for the first time really were beginning to enjoy the benefits of education, freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Um, all of that is going to go away. Um, and so there's, there, there's still, the Taliban has not said they're going to abandon Sharia law um, or the enforcement of Sharia law. And so I think we've got to expect that the freedoms that, for example, women have come to enjoy uh, are going to evaporate. And those women who were educated will be in grave, grave danger, including those who educated them at the university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we are all concerned about the Taliban and the impact, uh, as you say, that their rule will have on women in the region. And I quite agree with you that uh, Laura Bush and many other women have supported uh, their freedom over there. And it, it's frightening to all of us. Um, and so we've, you know, what do, what do we say about that? How do we even progress now? What do we do? So, Nancy, fo folks should remember, right, that the Taliban is the organization who were responsible for the safe haven that was provided to al-Qaeda um, and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to plan and launch the attacks of 9-11. The real heartbreaking, imagine if you were a gold star mother who had lost a son, um, yeah. to see Afghanistan now exactly where it was, back where it was when the 9-11 attacks happened. Um, 
it's really tragic. I mean, one of the greatest enablers for terrorism groups is safe haven. And we've got to assume that once again, Afghanistan has become a safe haven that will be home to terrorist activity. We know the Hekmat Tirid group is there. Um, we know that there are remnants of Al Qaeda there. Um, and frankly, with the federally administrated tribal areas just on the border uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, we know that too is a safe haven. And so we ought to we ought to expect um, to have to deal with that along with our allies in Europe the security threat that will emanate from there. Yeah, so we've we've allowed a number of Afghans into the country as refugees, escaping the Taliban. But are you satisfied with the way they've been vetted by our government? So the, the first priority were for special interest visas, and those were for translators who had worked with American troops. The vetting there has been actually quite extensive, and so you have American mm -hmm. military who served in Afghanistan um, vouching for, if you will, um, and the credibility of the Afghans who are coming. Most of the Afghan refugees have been put in neighboring countries, uh, Macedonia, Qatar, um, and other, uh, other countries in the region. The U.S. has been pretty select about taking only those Afghans who have uh, been of support to U.S. troops during the military effort. Um. You know, we've now passed the 20-year mark since the September 11th terrorist attacks. What have we learned in that time, and do you believe it's made us safer? I think, you know, if anyone had asked me it, right after 9-11, would we go 20 years and not have suffered another major attack on U.S. soil, I would have said no. The likelihood was we would have suffered an attack. Um, I think it's a real credit to our intelligence agencies, to our law enforcement agencies, mm -hmm. and frankly to state and local law enforcement that we've not suffered a major attack. Um, I think the Department of Homeland Security, could we have done it differently and where it would have been more effective? I do think that, and I do think there are changes that could be made to make it more effective. But I think the border control, you know, being more adept at controlling who, who and what crosses our borders and understanding that has absolutely made us safer. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm talking with former Homeland Security Advisor Fran Townsend. Um, as we mentioned, Fran, a few minutes ago, it's now more than 20 years since the September 11th terrorist attacks. In your view, has the Department of Homeland Security been effective in identifying and protecting risks to national security? Nancy, no big organization, entity the size of the department is perfect. Um, I think they've made great strides. The, the thing that I worry most about, um, sort of the next potential 9-11, is a cyber attack, a cyber, as Leon Panetta called it, a cyber Pearl Harbor. Um, and the Department of Homeland Security has got some capability there. They've got a lot of responsibility there. But our, the, the U.S. government's capability in the cyber area is spread across many government agencies. And I don't know that we're organized for success there. And that mm -hmm. very much concerns mm -hmm. me. <clears throat> and I think also, Fran, there's mounting concern that our southern border is vulnerable to infiltration by a host of some bad actors. Everyone from human traffickers and drug dealers to terrorists. Is that a serious risk or as serious as it looks, in your opinion? You know, it's, it's a tragedy. Frankly, you know, since the Biden administration has come into office during this administration, the numbers of those trying to cross the southern border is higher than it has ever been. We heard a lot about this during the Trump administration. We hear very little about it right now during the Biden administration, but the numbers are up and we ought to be concerned about it. Absolutely. It's it's a mm -hmm. tremendous threat. Mm -hmm. It's one we worried about in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, both people and, again, things crossing the border. Um, and we should continue to be worried about it now, especially with the rising numbers. Do we have any reason to believe that terrorist cells may have already crossed the border and could be in the process of planning attacks against Americans now? You know, Nancy, this is one of those one of those issues that was a real priority for the intelligence and law enforcement communities that we watched very closely. I have not been in the intelligence community for some time, um, but I have no reason to think that they've identified anyone who has already crossed the border. And it's, as I say, a real priority for um, intelligence and law mm -hmm. enforcement to be watchful for. 
And, and as you mentioned before, not all attacks against U.S. interests are violent. Uh, let's talk about cybersecurity for a minute, and specifically ransomware attacks. We've seen this happen many times. And of course, the attack that grabbed national headlines a few months ago was the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline. And I don't remember seeing gas lines like that since the 1970s. How does something like this happen, and can we expect more? I think for sure we're gonna, we ought to expect more. Businesses are now putting in enormous resources in terms of their cybersecurity posture, just because it's good business. Um, and they got they have to be able to continue to operate, as we saw the devastation when the Colonial Pipeline was unable to do that for some time. The real national policy question, I think, is going to be, what about paying this ransomware? Um, you know, in the terrorism context, we said we don't negotiate with terrorists, we don't pay uh, sort of ransom for hostages. Mm -hmm. And yet now we know in the Colonial Pipeline case that the company did pay the ransom. Um, but what's going to happen going forward? Will we have a national policy that basically says you can't pay ransom or you have to notify the government? The government has to be a part of that process so they can track it. Um, there's not the, the administration hasn't really defined their policy yet. And so each company is left to sort of deal with this on their own. In which case, in order to operate, if they've got to pay the ransom, they're going to pay it. Not long after the colonial ransomware attack, we saw an attack on Casio Software, who has thousands of U.S. and international clients who are all affected. When these cyber attacks and ransom payments are covered in the news, do the cyber attackers continue this practice? Do they view it as a profitable business? It for sure is a profitable business. They use cryptocurrency, which is more difficult to trace. Um, and they can move, you know, right? They have the technical capability to move ahead of law enforcement's ability to track them. And so even if some of the money, even if some of the ransomware is recovered, much of it is not. And so it is for sure profitable business. And they move on to look for the next vulnerable company uh, that they can extort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we, we know that both government and private industry have had their intellectual property compromised and stolen from foreign countries. Can you give us a sense or more of a sense of the scope of this theft? Oh, for sure. I mean, especially when you look at the, the largest sort of theft of American intellectual property has come from China. Um, that continues to be, and, and that is the the reason that's such a threat is a lot of the theft of that intellectual property is technical. Um, whether you're talking about semiconductors or um, technical equipment, this is a real problem, right? Because it all the research and development money that American companies invest is then the benefit goes to Chinese companies that mm -hmm. t take that, mm -hmm. reverse engineer it, and then make a cheaper product that they sell back into the United States. This is going to have to be mm -hmm. part part of the policy that the Biden administration tackles with China. Mm -hmm. Indeed. If, if there is theft of intellectual property, does it go hand in hand with identity theft, something that obviously has a much more personal impact on all of us? We're going to ask Fran Townsend about that when we come back. Welcome back to Conversations. Uh, I'm talking with uh, my friend, and uh, former Homeland Security Advisor and member of the National Security Council, Fran Townsend. So before the break, we spoke about intellectual property and personal identity theft. So if we're at home or at work, what steps do you think we should take to protect ourselves online? You know, Nancy, now that everything is online, we have so many passwords, but it, that makes us vulnerable because I don't know about you, but what you tend to do is, is use the same password <laughs> over and over. What that means is if that password is stolen, they wind, the bad guys, the criminals or the state actors wind up with access to many of your accounts, including financial accounts. What's most important is that you have a one dual authentication. That is normally you don't just have a password, but you'll get a, a, um, a text to your phone with a unique code. Um, the other thing is to have passwords. If it's just a password that has, you know, multiple different, it's not just letters, but it's numbers, it's characters, it's capitals and not and lowercase, 
And then you have to be able to keep those. You can't keep them on your phone, the passwords on your phone, because, again, if it gets hacked, we just saw Apple issue just right. today, just yesterday a new software update to prevent hacking um, of this sort. If any of us think we have been victims of an attack, what, if any, are the next steps to take? Sure. So first thing you, want, you need to do is change your passwords um, and notify mm -hmm. the company and change your passwords immediately. Um, the other part of this is really the government, the U.S. government, understanding, because they don't always get a good picture of the breadth of the problem, right? They rely on companies, frankly, because an individual isn't going to call the Department of Homeland Security. They rely on the companies to report in. DHS has got sectors where each industry reports into the department, but they have to improve the reporting. They've got to make it easier for the companies, and they've yeah. got to be able to convince the companies and guarantee for the companies that that information will be private. Because, of course, if it becomes public that they've had a breach, um, that also affects the business. So should these sort of personal cyber attacks be uh, considered for budgetary focus, uh, viewed as legitimate national security threats? Absolutely. I, I think there's no way around it. And this is only going to become more and more important. You know, when you think about all of the smart dev devices that will be in your home, ovens, mm -hmm. refrigerators, lights, heating, um, just imagine if a state actor is able to hack into that. Um, it's, it's not just a, a national infrastructure problem where we worry about the air traffic control system going out or the electricity grid growing out, but imagine the collection capability that the Chinese will have access to if they could hack into your home and turn on microphones, for example. We know that they were responsible for the OPM attack where folks like you and I had our, all of our information, including financials, stolen. Um, imagine if they can pair that along with real-time information. Um, some, of, some folks like you and I go back in and out of the government. I mean, it's a treasure trove of intelligence for them. Who do you think poses the biggest threat to us in this regard, China or Russia? Or both? Well, bo both. <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could pick one. I I do think China's got the greater capability. Um, they just have more people working against it. Russia tends to work not just with state actors but criminal groups. They use folks outside the government. But I I would say if I was choosing, probably China is the greater cyber threat. You know, you've served both Democrat and Republican administrations, which is very interesting. And. Presidents Clinton and President Bush. So I want to get your objective opinion on where we stand now on efforts to keep Americans safe from threats. So I think the threats have changed, obviously. Um, we talked about cyber. I don't think we're organized for success there. Just as post 9-11, what we did was create the National Counterterrorism Center so that there was a single place where not only all information, but the analysis, the capability resided. And so the president had access in one in a single place to all instruments of national power. Um, that doesn't exist when it comes to cyber. There is a cyber command, which is very important. But you need a national center where the president has both offensive and defensive capabilities that is a joint operation um, among military and civilian agencies so that you understand mm -hmm. all of the capabilities at the president's disposal um, so that he, he can choose the most effective tools in any particular scenario. And so I think we need to do that before there is a major cyber attack um, so that we are best prepared. So in your opinion, it would also maybe include some state strategies uh, for people, state governments, and also community uh, uh, kinds of actions and training. Um, do, you, do you think that is important and that perhaps we should be applying some budget in these places to be, make sure people are brought up to date? Absolutely. I mean, you look at Texas. Texas has had a, a number of county, dozen counties attacked. Um, also, school districts attacked, and these are these are counties and, and areas that don't have the necessary budget. I think just like in the terrorism area, we've got to make state and have our state and local partners be sitting there with us, and we mm -hmm. have to invest in giving them the capability they need to protect themselves. Fran Thompson, 
thanks so much for sharing your insight with us today and your time, by the way. You're a busy woman. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now. Uh, I could talk to you all day and probably still have more questions. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me for my next conversation. So long. Just watch Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news channel now in more than 70 million homes. You can get Newsmax TV on your cable system or check your cable guide. And if your system doesn't carry Newsmax, call them, tell them you want Newsmax TV because we're real news for real people.